Enigmatic North America, Chapter 5, Episode 5, Vikings in Oklahoma and Minnesota. The Hevener Runestone is located on Poteo Mountain, just outside of Hevener, Oklahoma, near the Arkansas border. On the west-facing side of the large 12-foot-high slab of rock are inscriptions identical to Old Norse script. There are local oral stories that point to the inscription first being viewed in the late 1800s. The locals of the area used to refer to this as Indian Rock, thinking that it had been carved by Native Americans before white people had settled the area. In the book In Plain Sight, Old World Records in Ancient America, the author Gloria Farley described the first time she saw the petroglyph as a young girl. She was hiking with family friends and recalls lichen and moss growing around and within the grooves of the inscription at the time. The father of Farley's friend that had taken them hiking to the mountain that day reported that he had first seen the Indian rock in 1913. It wasn't until 1948 that Gloria Farley pieced together that the carving on the rock appeared to be an old Scandinavian inscription. Farley had read about the Kensington runestone in Minnesota, which we will analyze later in this chapter, and recognized that some of those characters resembled what could be found on Poteo Mountain in Hebner, Oklahoma. Farley sent a photo of the petroglyph to the Smithsonian and received a reply that they had already had a photo on record from 1923. The Smithsonian had correctly determined that they were runic, but that they thought it was most likely a recent creation with the help of a Scandinavian grammar guide. One of the explanations given by skeptics is that these were carved by Boy Scouts. Gloria Farley explains in her book that she believes this narrative of Boy Scouts was wrong and why she believed it was based on a misunderstanding. In 1949, while living in Ohio, I met Dr. Robert E. Bell, head of anthropology at Oklahoma University, who was visiting my hometown. When I mentioned the huge carved stone near Hebner, he said he knew of it because of a copy of my letter to the Smithsonian had been referred to him. Bell said that he would investigate. However, Bell dropped the investigation because of information he had received in 1949 from Glenn Bordwell. He understood Bordwell to say that in the 1920s, Hebner's Boy Scout troops had carved the letters on the Hebner stone. I knew this was a misunderstanding because Bordwell, friend of my brother Buck Stewart, would have been three years old when Kemmerer reported his finds in 1913. It took me until 1959 to locate Bordwell in Alaska. His answering letter to my inquiry explained that his scout troop did not carve the runes but had scraped the moss out of the grooves. The runestone had several translations, with one of them meaning no metal or little valley. Another translation is Gloam's Valley. The mysterious runestone received new interest in the 21st century when a language expert named Professor Henrik Williams of Uppsala University in Sweden investigated the site. In a 2022 YouTube conversation with Dr. Jackson Crawford, a fellow expert in Norse writing, Professor Williams gave a presentation on American runestones. In this presentation, Williams goes over a list of different examples of runestones that can be found and gave his analysis. The majority of the presentation is him giving very convincing evidence as to why the majority of the examples of runestones in America are likely recent creations. Out of all the examples of runes that he had on his list, the Hebner runestone was the only one that was labeled as the jury's out, meaning that he was still unsure as to how this inscription became. Williams explains his labeling of the Hebner runestone in his 2022 conversation with Dr. Jackson Crawford. I cannot for the life of me believe that this is an 8th century or 9th century runestone. It's also very difficult to determine this stone as being a modern product. If it's as old as it's claimed to be from the 1870s, who would have had knowledge of runes in this area at that time? There were no Scandinavians whatsoever here at that time and quite few people altogether. He goes on to mention that some of the symbols on the Hebner runestone could be found in an 1867 book by George Stevens and that it perhaps is possible that someone was inspired by this book to inscribe the rune. He explained that he was skeptical of that explanation though due to the fact that that book most likely cost a fortune and that it would be highly unlikely that anyone from Oklahoma would have access to it. Williams went on to sarcastically state, I am more and more leaning toward the theory that Martians probably carved this because it is inexplicable as an ancient runestone and it's also very difficult to explain as a modern one. Perhaps the most popular example of a runestone is in Kensington, Minnesota. In 1879, Olaf Oman, a Swedish immigrant, arrived in Douglas County, Minnesota. During the autumn of 1898, while clearing trees on his land, he claimed to have discovered a large rock engraved with intricate designs. For over a century, experts in various fields, such as science, geology, and linguistics, have dedicated their time and resources to investigating the runestone with the aim of determining whether it's an authentic artifact. In 1907, historian H.R. Holland visited Olaf to gather information about the stone for a book he was writing about Norwegian migration. After studying the stone for over two years, he produced what most people agree is the most accurate translation of the inscription. Eight Goths and 22 Norwegians journey of exploration from Vinland very far west. We had camped by two rock islands one day's journey north from this stone. 
We were out fishing one day. After we came home, we found ten men red with blood and dead. Ava Virgo, Maria, save us from evil. Have ten men by the sea to look after our ships. Fourteen days journey from this island, year 1362. Geologist John Stewart was the first person to photograph the inscriptions and attempt a scientific evaluation of the stone's geology. According to him, the carved features of the stone show as much age as the weathered surface, indicating that the carved surface and its inscriptions are equally weathered. In Edwin Larson's 2007 documentary, 1362, The Kensington Enigma, forensic geologist Scott Walter pointed out that the stone had writings on both the front and side surfaces, with the side surface cut around the same time as the inscription was made. Walter also took a chipped sample off a fractured part of the stone and looked at the micas underneath a microscope. The chip sample was fresh and not degraded, while the weathered front surface's micas had decomposed as expected. If the stones were a modern forgery, Walter argued that micas would be available on the cut side, which was not the case. There are still people that are skeptical of its authenticity. Dr. Jackson Crawford, an expert in Norse languages, notes discrepancies between the pentatic numerals and the Arabic numerals within the script. Pentatic numerals are an old numeral system that was used in Scandinavia but is no longer widely used. He argues that the writer of the Kensington runestone was attempting to use pentatic numerals as if they were Arabic numerals, which raises red flags. Crawford explains why in his 2020 YouTube video, The Kensington Runestone, Expert Analysis, citing Michael Barnes' book, Runes, a handbook. For example, 14 is written wrong, using the pentatic symbol for 1, then the symbol for 4, instead of the symbol for 14. No European in 1362 would have been thinking in Arabic numerals this way. Arabic numerals were not well known in the North until the 1500s, and pentatic numerals are an even later development. Crawford also explains that the language on the runestone resembles 19th and 20th century Swedish, not the language of the 1300s when it was supposedly written. The Kensington runestone still causes so much controversy. On one hand, you do have some interesting evidence that shows clear weathering in a way that would support its authenticity. The troubles with the pentatic numerals that Crawford points out is also valuable information that should be considered when trying to understand the reality behind the stone. Out of all the runestones discussed in this chapter, I personally believe that the Hevener runestone is most likely to be authentic. It was well known in the area from an early time, and the script used makes sense for the time period in question. I find it difficult to believe that someone with the knowledge to make this carving would have been living in eastern Oklahoma during the time it was first documented. In the end, both the Kensington and Hevener runestones remain a mystery. I encourage readers to conduct further research on the subject and form their own opinions. Stay tuned for Chapter 6, Episode 6, where we head to Utah to take a look at a petroglyph panel out there with some very interesting features of animals that look like they don't belong. This is the Rochester petroglyph panel out here that has the petroglyph in the top left of what looks like a crocodile and a hippopotamus. We're going to take a real close look at that, as well as some other petroglyphs on the panel that are strikingly similar to Egyptian symbolism. I'm really looking forward to sharing that episode with you all. This is a really wild chapter. It's very controversial on some of the shorts that I've made in reels and TikToks. People have gotten really angry about this one. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you all the story that I investigated here so you all can decide for yourself. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider buying my book, Enigmatic North America, Legends, Oddities, and Controversial History. I'd really appreciate it. And if you can't swing the book, no worries. Keep enjoying these videos. Please like, subscribe, share. Thanks everybody so much. Until next time, take care.